I would like to introduce you to Dr. Ode Hneen, who is the Director of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Program in the Clinical and Research Program in the Pediatric Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital, and is an Assistant Professor of Psychology at the Harvard Medical School. She specializes in the cognitive behavioral treatment of children with mood and disruptive behavior and anxiety disorders. Her research focuses on the efficacy and cognitive behavioral interventions for children, adolescents, and young adults with anxiety disorders and bipolar disorder, as well as the long longitudinal studies of children at risk for mood and anxiety uh, disorders. So with that, I would like you to uh, have Dr. Hanin start. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, how to support uh, and best support uh, young people uh, who identify as transgender or gender diverse. Um, as uh, Sarah was mentioning, uh, I've been uh, very interested in uh, helping youth with mood and anxiety disorders and over the past several years, um, have become increasingly uh, aware of the needs for uh, transgender youth uh, and their families to have interventions that are adapted uh, to their specific needs and also the vulnerability of this population. So thank you for your interest in, in this talk um, and please don't hesitate to ask questions uh, as uh, I go forward. Oh, excuse me, I need to remember how to use this arrow. So just quickly, um, I want to review kind of common terminology and some of the issues uh, that are commonly faced by transgender youth, and then really think a little bit about how to best support uh, these youth in your practices um, with some specific suggestions and guidelines, and as I said, answer any questions that you may have. Um, I just wanted to start by showing pictures of uh, transgender kids and youth. Um, these are just a few of the kids, many of whom are, are local, um, many of whom you may have seen on various uh, news programs, and I think it's just highlighting the diversity of the kids um, that we want to support and help, um, and highlighting, um, uh, unfortunately, the young woman in the middle is Leela Alcorn, who you may or may not know. Uh, committed suicide a few years ago um, after being rejected by her family and community. So also, as I'll highlight throughout this presentation, some of the very real risks um, that these kids uh, face. Um, so just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, because I know often people have a lot of questions about some of the terminology and it can make people pretty anxious um, that they're going to use the wrong term or um, uh, you know, offend uh, people who are transgender. Uh, by, by saying something wrong. Um, so just to kind of give you a quick primer, the, the meaning of transgender, it's really a very broad term that tells you not a whole lot about how any one individual identifies other than the fact that their internal sense of gender does not match the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, and so often you'll hear people talk about uh, trans for short and just a quick kind of highlight, because I know it's a mistake um, that I certainly made earlier on um, in my career, uh, there's no ED at the end of transgender, so you should describe somebody as transgender, not transgendered. Um, and just remember that it's a label that's given to the person themselves, not one that we tell other people that they are or are not. Um, so it's really uh, allowing the, the person to identify how they identify, not how we think they ought to. Um, You'll hear a lot of different terms, and, and to be honest, language, I mean, we know that language is ever evolving anyways, and particularly around uh, gender identity um, and gender expression, uh, I think there's been a, a really pretty rapid explosion of, um, of language changes. And so, I mean, the bottom line is, if you don't know something, just ask. Um, no one expects that you will know all of the terms for every single person, and I think no one will be upset if you ask how they identify um, if you're not sure, or ask them what that means uh, if you don't know what that particular identity is. Um, you know, and again, for example, things have changed so recently. We used to call a lot of kids uh, or adolescents gender nonconforming, um, and now that's really not a term, for example, that's used anymore, and now we really talk about um, people being gender diverse or gender expansive, or in some cases, gender creative. Um, the idea being that this idea that you, you, know, you either conform or you don't uh, was a little bit hurtful to the community. 
Um, you'll also hear a lot of younger people in particular identify as gender queer or gender fluid, meaning that they don't fall on uh, a binary. And I think that's really been one of the more recent revolutionary concepts that's been very helpful is um, this concept that gender is not necessarily binary, but that people can really fall along a continuum um, in terms of their identity and expression. Um, and that has opened up, I think, a lot of um, different terms then for people to, to identify. Um, some people define themselves as gender neutral or agender, meaning that they don't feel strongly either uh, masculine, that they are masculine or feminine. Um, and you'll hear pan gender, uh, bi gender. So again, uh, ask uh, when in doubt. Um, a couple of other terms that are important to, to know. Um, so cisgender. Uh, so cisgender uh, refers to people who are not transgender, um, meaning purely that they identify on the same side as the sex that they were assigned at birth. And the reason that that has really uh, been a, an important shift in terms of uh, language is that before you were either transgender or you were kind of quote unquote normal. Um, and so that automatically created sort of an us and them dynamic. And so just by saying like transgender or cisgender, it kind of evens the playing field. So you'll hear that term used frequently. Um, and it just means on the same side of that. That's actually what cis means. Um, gender dysphoria, which is uh, something that you probably have encountered in your practices. Um, not all transgender people and transgender youth have gender dysphoria. Um, but a, a percentage do. And uh, what gender dysphoria refers to is a very strong, very distressing and unpleasant uh, sense that their, their body is not right, that they are not right in the world. Um, and it, it actually is a tremendous risk factor for so, some pretty negative outcomes because no matter where you go, there you are. And so you can't outrun gender dysphoria and it, it, the, the, the pain of it is, can, can be quite significant. Um, the idea of stealth versus out um, is, uh, I think, a term that comes up pretty frequently. Stealth meaning that the child or the person um, is living in their gender identity and uh, does not necessarily let other people know that they're trans or gender diverse um, versus out where they're pretty open about it. Um, and again, that's really a choice that needs to be made by the child and their family. And it's important in that there are different pros and cons to being stealth versus out. Um, there's some data that suggests that kids who are stealth are less likely to be bullied or victimized. But on the other hand, there is a, sometimes a tremendous amount of anxiety uh, about being found out. Um, and if if they are outed, uh, there can be some uh, significant risks and repercussions. Um, people can get pretty upset. Um, and being out, obviously, there's a sort of a greater comfort and less anxiety about being outed, but um, kids can sometimes be at higher risk then for, for victimization or bullying. And I think as a provider, I think we have to be very thoughtful um, about uh, whether or not we, we want to out a child. This is something that I think about often in my medical record. If a child is not out, um, how do I? Uh, still uh, describe their care without putting them at risk, for example, if the parent were to get the record. So it does require a little bit of thoughtfulness around that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about transitioning and, and this idea that there are uh, you know, different forms of transition. And you'll hear sort of social transition, medical affirmation. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, just quickly, and again, some of this may be old hat for some of you, um, but just when we're, I think often all of these concepts get a little bit mixed up, um, which then can make people get very anxious, um, uh, you know, in schools or other places. So sex is uh, what you are assigned at birth, male or female, but uh, sex is also not binary, um, biological sex, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, some people are intersex. Um, and that is different from gender identity, which as I talked about is your core sense of yourself, uh, you know, in terms of being feminine or masculine or on those spectra somewhere. And gender expression, which is how you express your gender um, outwardly. And that is not the same thing as gender identity. And it uh, has more to do with things like clothing, hair, voice, posture, but, uh, but it does not uh, equate gender identity. Um, and then sexual orientation, which is who you are attracted to uh, romantically, sexually, emotionally, and that's very different from, uh, from gender identity and expression. 
Um, this is something I'm not sure if uh, you've seen this, but this is actually a really fantastic way of assessing uh, these various constructs in kids and teens. It's free. It's available on the website. Um, and I think they do a really nice job of um, uh, differentiating identity, expression, uh, sex assigned at birth, and uh, attraction. I like that they break up physical attraction and emotional attraction, and also that they have different continuum for female and male, so that it's not female on one side or male on the other, which really allows for people who may be non-binary to um, share with you uh, their, their experience. Um, so definitely this is one of the better measures of, of gender um, uh, identity expression uh, and sexual orientation. Um, just quickly, you know, we often get a lot of questions about how kids can possibly know what their gender identity is, which is always a little bit interesting because I don't think anybody would say that uh, a child who is cisgender can't possibly know, but, um, but nevertheless, it's helpful to have a sense of, of how gender identity and gender expression evolves, because in fact, it's one of the earliest um, senses of self that develops. And it's almost, it's pre-verbal. I mean, in fact, if you think about it, it's even prenatal. The very first question that's asked when someone um, announces that they are having a child is boy or girl. So it's such an inherent part of identity um, that develops uh, in infancy and toddlerhood so that by toddlerhood and preschool age, kids can self-label as boy or girl. Um, and they'll play around a little bit with gender impression, expression, but um, but they will be able to tell you pretty clearly. And that's, I think, one of the issues is that because it's preverbal, I always think about that. If I had to describe to someone, how do I know that I'm a woman? I'm a cisgender woman. How do I know that? Well, I, I don't know. I just do. It's not it's not based on my appearance. It's, not based, it, it's, it's just so core. And yet we keep asking often transgender and gender diverse kids to explain to us how they know uh, who they are. And that is just something to be aware of. It, it may not be, a, 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 often is not a fair question. Um, and so, you know, into the preschool years, um, kids will definitely play around um, a little bit with expression, but they start to become much more aware. Their gender identity is stable. It's pretty unusual um, for kids to be shifting rapidly in their gender identity. I mean, some kids may not identify as uh, boy or girl because they are uh, gender fluid or, or gender diverse. Um, but we start to see a lot more constancy, um, and they start to become much more aware of gender roles, often in a much more stereotyped way. Um, and you know, you see sort of the princess stage or the the superhero stage around this age, um, which then, as kids get older, becomes a little bit more integrated, a little less rigid. Um, and uh, you know, and even though their gender, their sense of gender may be fixed how they conceptualize that and how they integrate that um, into their sense of self uh, becomes a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and then certainly in puberty, um, it's pretty unusual for kids after puberty to desist in their gender identity. It happens once in a while, but um, really um, if a child is identifying um, as transgender or gender diverse throughout uh, childhood and, and into puberty, um, the, the odds are uh, of their changing that um, are, are pretty slim, um, even though they may still kind of play around with gender expression and, and how they define themselves, you know, with specific words um, and maybe non-conforming for lots of different reasons. Um, the gender identity is, is, is pretty fixed. Um, what can happen, and, and I've seen a number of articles about this, um, so it, it, it's a lot easier in some ways when a child has identified um, as being transgender or gender diverse uh, since early childhood. Sometimes, and not unusually, we see uh, a child uh, coming out, if you will, around puberty and adolescence. Um, and that raises questions, I think, sometimes for parents about whether this is a quote unquote real thing or peer influences. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons why that might be. Um, often kids may not even know. I've, I've had some patients who have told me that I never knew that it was possible to be transgender. I didn't know that was a thing. That was never part of my, you know, I don't know what, I didn't know what I didn't know. I knew something was different, but I didn't have the words for it. Um, and as they got older and were exposed to, to, to more people and, and more concepts, they realized that they were transgender. Sometimes there may be other reasons as well, having to do um, with cultural or religious or other uh, family beliefs that might make it very hard for a child to um, to identify uh, as transgender until they're a little bit older. So I also want to make it clear that because someone hasn't come out 
when they were young does not mean that it isn't um, real. At the same time, it's important, so lots of kids will be gender non-conforming in their behaviors and their expression. They can be creative and it does not automatically mean that they are transgender. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of young children who um, are creative in their gender expression will grow up to be either uh, heterosexual cisgender or sexual minority. And, and a small percentage will uh, be transgender. Um, so I think sometimes parents get very anxious. Oh my gosh, you know, my son really likes the color pink and is wearing nail polish. Um, that does not mean that they are transgender. We don't need to start transitioning them right away. Um, we start to think about a child being transgender uh, when they are persistent, consistent, and insistent about their identity. Um, so these are kids who will repeatedly um, uh, behave in ways that are, you know, not gender typical, will tell you repeatedly, no, I'm a girl, or I'm not a boy, or I'm not a girl, um, will be insistent, will kind of, you know, not let it go. Um, and in those instances, then um, we really start to think about um, the child of being uh, transgender or gender diverse. Um, so just, you know, sometimes I get a lot of questions about the fact that this is a fairly rare condition, so why should we be so worried about uh, transgender kids? Well, it's actually quite common. It's more common than type 1 diabetes, and I don't think any of us would argue that um, that's an insignificant uh, number. So um, it, is, it is much more common than you might think, um, and there are suggestions that uh, the numbers are increasing, quite possibly because there's more discussion, there's more recognition. Um, the idea, uh, sort of the fact that um, people can identify as non-binary and that that's recognized, I think also um, means that a lot more people won't feel like they have to be boxed into one or the other. Um, so we're definitely seeing um, greater numbers in younger age groups. Um, and also important to recognize that biology is not as binary. So when people sort of get very hung up on, you know, well, they're boys, they're girls, actually, you know, a lot of people are intersex. Um, more people are intersex than uh, people are redheaded. So again, I think there's a lot of this just because we don't talk about it um, isn't recognized, but, but certainly this is a, a significant group. I wanted to highlight um, a recent policy statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which I think is really important. Um, so up until uh, fairly recently, um, the, the advice was what was called watchful waiting. So if a child um, asserted their uh, transgender or gender diverse identity when they were young, the idea was to kind of wait and see um, if it um, kind of kept on until a certain age, which often was post puberty. Um, and, and now the uh, AAP has changed its position in a way that I think is really important, which is that actually this watchful waiting is not helpful and actually causes a lot of distress uh, for children and that there is no reason not to support them in their gender identity um, earlier on uh, as opposed to making them wait uh, to some arbitrary age. Um, and so that's just something in your, uh, in your practices to know. Um, so in terms of affirmation, and again, I may be preaching to the choir, and this may be um, obvious uh, to all of you, and um, if it is, then I apologize. So uh, I think people get sometimes very anxious that uh, we're doing all of these medical procedures on kids, and we're not. Um, really what we're talking about in terms of affirmation, um, particularly in younger age groups, uh, has to do with social and legal affirmation, allowing the child to, um, to, to appear in a way that is consistent with their gender identity, to use a name that is consistent, to use uh, gender markers that are consistent, um, and to make sure that they are able to express themselves in a safe uh, way that, uh, that affirms who they are. Um, and uh, increasingly for children who uh, have come out before puberty, uh, we'll use puberty blockers um, to give them, to put a pause on puberty um, after they're in 10 or two, um, and give them a chance to um, determine which puberty uh, will 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 be the better uh, option for them, and I know that there are a number of of questions about that. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to better understand um, some of the the impact of this, and certainly there are uh, long term ramifications for fertility uh, potentially. Um, puberty blockers per se have been used uh, for many years in uh, children with precocious puberty. 
um, but this is obviously a bit of a different group, and so certainly uh, there's a lot of research being done to, to look at the impact. Um, but I also would argue that we know that going through the wrong puberty is often so traumatic um, and uh, you know, a cause of tremendous distress and also uh, causes changes that, that in some instances are irreversible, uh, particularly for trans women, that a lot of the secondary sex characteristics uh, uh, aren't really readily changed uh, later on. And so I think weighing the pros and cons of these various approaches is, is important. Um, and then uh, for, for youth who, uh, for whom this is indicated uh, go, using cross-sex hormones and then eventually gender-affirming surgery, uh, and just a heads up, there used to be um, a thought that this was something to be done at 18 or older. Um, a number of uh, clinics and, and surgeons are now doing it a little bit earlier, not before 16, but somewhere around 16, 17, because of the recognition that it's actually probably better to have the child still home as opposed to waiting till they, in theory, launch as adults. There's a lot of post-op care. Uh, that needs to happen and requires a fair amount of uh, vigilance and diligence. Um, and college age kids are not uh, known necessarily for, for that skill. So uh, having the kid home where the parent can still support them in that uh, may be a better choice. Um, that's still, uh, you know, that things are changing rapidly around some of this. Uh, so I just wanted to talk quickly about some of the common issues that we see, just some of the data. Um, so there, it is true that as a group, uh, transgender kids and adolescents are at much higher risk than uh, cisgender kids for a number of uh, psychiatric conditions, um, and that does not discount their gender identities. So I think often we see parents who uh, have trouble uh, accepting or, or validating their child's gender identity because their child is suffering from a significant psychiatric condition. Um, but the recommendations are really uh, to address both, not to wait until the child is well or much better to, to address the gender identity. Um, having said that, it is important to recognize that um, kids, these are young kids. This study uh, was uh, three to nine years, uh, well, this particular group was three to nine years old, and you're seeing already high rates of depressive disorders and anxiety disorders um, in this population. Uh, and the numbers are even a little bit more humbling when you look at adolescents um, who are at particularly high risk for uh, depression um, and mood disorders as well as anxiety. So just be very aware in your practice. This is really something to screen for. Um, these kids really are at, at high risk and also at risk for suicidal ideation. So in this particular group, it was 10% uh, in the transmasculine uh, group and about 75 in the transfeminine um, as well as uh, NSSI, so non-suicidal self-injurious behaviors, which is also something that we see pretty frequently. Um, so again, these are things to, to really screen. Um, the severity of these conditions is also uh, important to recognize. So these are not mild. Uh, this is a group that is at high risk for hospitalization. So obviously pretty severe forms of these disorders. Um, so it's just uh, and important to recognize that these kids can uh, come in with pretty acute needs, which is one reason that um, that a number of us in, in the department have really been working to develop a program to better meet the needs of these kids um, and hopefully intervene a little bit earlier. So the question is, why would that be? Why might these kids be at such high risk for, for a number of disorders? And, and really the model that we use to understand uh, why that is, um, and the data that exists supports this, this general model, uh, really has to do with a minority stress model, which has been used um, across a number of different um, minority groups and the, the, the stresses that they experience. Um, and, and briefly, this model posits that um, being the member of a visible minority, which in this case, um, and, and there can be, by the way, intersections between various uh, minority statuses, um, so in this case, gender identity, um, is associated with uh, both internal and external stress processes that are particular to belonging to this minority group. So in addition to all of the general stressors that um, people face, being a member of a visible minority um, adds to the stressors that you experience, both in terms of external stressors, which has to do with violence, discrimination, bullying, rejection, 
and also internal processes. So uh, this is everything from internalized transphobia and gender dysphoria to expecting rejection. Um, through the numerous experiences that people have, they come to expect negative outcomes um, and learn sort of a lot of self-loathing, learn that they're not quote unquote normal, uh, you know, feel very, a lot of trans kids will tell you that they, they feel very uncomfortable with being trans. Um, and so those processes put individuals at much higher risk for mental health and uh, other health uh, uh, problems. Um, it's also recognized that there are factors that can help buffer those stressors. And those include uh, learning coping skills, having social support, and I'll show you a little bit of data around that, um, but also uh, characteristics of minority identity. So how, uh, for example, how proud you are, which is why pride is such an important um, concept uh, that, um, you know, that, that being able to be part of the community, being proud can be a buffer. Um, and so, we're, what, when we're working with um, transgender or gender diverse kids, we're trying to reduce some of the external stressors that they experience and uh, help address their internal stressors, but also build up coping and social support, um, increase some of the positive uh, valences of being a member of this uh, gender minority. Just in case um, you weren't aware of the safety risks, they are very real. Um, and uh, a lot of this is uh, even in Massachusetts where sometimes I think we think that um, things are pretty good but maybe not always as good as we might think. Um, so uh, in a recent study by Sari Reisner uh, at HMS, 83% um, of youth reported bullying and 55% reported being attacked or experiencing physical violence. So this is not just verbal bullying um, and 30% re reported this in school. Um, interestingly, 70% uh, of youth, and now th this, uh, this one statistic wasn't just trans youth, um, but 70% of youth uh, reported hearing homophobic or transphobic statements routinely in school. And I think that matters because sometimes we only focus on the more extreme forms of discrimination or bullying or, um, or, or aggression, but the kind of milder but more frequent uh, denigrating statements also have a tremendous impact and I think we need to make sure that we recognize how common those are and really address those. Um, I'm always sort of surprised. I hear them often in my office um, and uh, you know the more we, we kind of call that out is not a, a, an okay way to talk routinely. I think the, 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 the better off everyone will be. Um, also at high risk for uh, physical violence when interacting with police, sexual violence and uh, problems at work when they get uh, older. Uh, for for in terms of health disparities, which is something that is being increasingly recognized, so we know that transgender people are at higher risk for very poor health outcomes um, in large, well, in part because uh, getting health care um, can be so unpleasant and distressing and discriminatory that many people wait until they are so incredibly ill uh, to get care. Um, and also um, don't necessarily get the care that they need. Um, and so in a, in a focus group a few years ago, uh, there were several health disparities that were identified, including um, you know, frank safety issues, but also poor access to physical health services. Um, so that includes everything from having providers who are knowledgeable about trans health care and recognize that a trans man, for example, may still need a pap smear or a trans woman may still need a prostate exam um, in addition to uh, uh, prevention and care for uh, STIs, HIV, um, and, and other uh, fertility uh, care. Um, not surprisingly, inadequate mental health resources is, is an ongoing issue um, and problems with insurance, which is still um, quite common. Um, and uh, there are a lot of resources. If any of you uh, have patients who are running into this, there is a lot of free legal help uh, for trans people in terms of um, health care, name changes, et cetera. I'm happy to, to provide those, those resources. And it's also important to recognize that uh, the disparities are, are particularly pronounced for transgender women of color um, who are at high, high risk for violence and um, HIV and other uh, really distressing health outcomes. 
Um, just a couple of other things to um, be aware of in, when you're working with trans kids is uh, how many additional concerns they have. And they may not always state them, so you may need to ask. There's so many things that um, we take for granted, being cis, that trans and uh, trans kids don't um, don't have the luxury of doing, uh, of, you know, just assuming. So I, I had a kid explain to me how anxious she gets every time she's in the bathroom because she worries about the fact that her feet, when she's in the stall, her feet are going to be facing the wrong way when she pees. Um, and to me, that was so moving because that was something that I had never even thought about and that she has to think about every time she uses a public bathroom um, because she's afraid someone will say something. Um, there's a lot of issues around dating and sexuality uh, for teenagers. When do they tell? You know, will they be able to date? Will they be loved? Um, what are the risks? So I think really recognizing that there are all sorts of things that these kids are having to think about um, that they may not verbalize, but that uh, affects uh, their day to day. So what can we do to enhance positive outcomes? Because now that I've said all the really upsetting, scary stuff, um, I think there really is a lot that we can do. Um, and you know, in terms of the basics, a uh, couple of really important things um, have to do with making sure that all of your staff is trained. Um, so often we focus, for example, now on clinicians, but it's really critical that all staff, front desk, security, cleaning, um, that everyone be trained because often, even if clinicians are trained, if a trans person has a very negative experience walking into your clinic, they're not coming back, they'll leave. And, and it also just creates a level of distress that's not okay. Um, so making sure that everyone is conversant, uh, savvy, um, and able to work with uh, trans kids uh, in a way that's affirming is important. It's also really important to be explicit about trans inclusivity. So I think we cannot assume that people will trust that it is a safe and friendly place for them unless we make that clear. And that can be everything from, um, I mean, even just as simple as putting a sticker that, sh that highlights the fact that this is a safe place for trans kids. Um, and I think making sure that that's visible, that is reassuring. Um, in the same way, it's really important that all forms and questionnaires be appropriate for all gender identities. I know uh, EPIC, uh, for those of you who are fortunate, and I am saying fortunate in quotes, enough to use EPIC, and now they've really, um, uh, they recently updated it, so now uh, you can record uh, sex assigned at birth and gender identity to make sure that you use the right name, the right pronoun, um, and also that on your forms you don't force people to box into male or female, boy, girl. Um, and all of that is, is critical because without all of these um, important details, you're, you're, you're not going to get uh, anywhere, like nothing else, you, 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 they won't, uh, trans kids won't, won't come. Um, I also think, and this is something that we don't talk about uh, necessarily, but is really important, is really noting and um, owning our own biases. We all have them. We all have preconceived notions. We all create these heuristics in our mind. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge them and be aware of them and actively work on them. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad doctor. Um, but I think sometimes we don't want to, to really pay attention to ways that we might be um, acting in a way that, you know, with the best of intentions is actually unhelpful. I and mean, I think it's also important to be open to other people pointing it out because sometimes we may not be aware of, of language that we're using or, or behaviors that we are uh, engaging in that um, that are hurtful or unhelpful, and so being able to kindly point that out on each other and being open to that is really critical. Um, in terms of interacting with kids or with their families, um, there, and this is relevant for parents too. So often uh, there's a, a difference between passive versus active acceptance and support. So I think a lot of kids and and kids are extremely aware and sensitive. To, to this, where we say, yep, yep, no, we, you know, we support you, we, you know, we, we value you and we love you, but then we never ask about their experience again. And it sort of becomes a don't ask, don't tell situation at home or in other settings. And, and that, I think, sends a lot of messages about discomfort. So we have to be comfortable asking about their experiences in all different ways. Um, you know, asking about who they're dating, asking about, you know, how was it to have to come out to this person um, after your first date? What did you do? How, you know, 
um, and again, for physicians, that may be a little bit easier, but I think for families, too, really highlighting that if you would ask these things with a cisgender child, you want to ask them with a transgender child. Um, again, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to use the affirming pronoun and name. Um, really, really work. And if you aren't sure, ask. And if you make a mistake, because you will, just acknowledge it and apologize. Um, it happens. It's changing language, particularly if you've known the kid with one name or one pronoun and, and then uh, they change. It can take a while, but just own it. Um, and just recognize that they're always going to be ahead um, of the game and that we're always going to be a day late and a dollar short. So kids are always going to be leading the charge and that's okay. So just try, you know, follow them. Um, I had a really good question about uh, what if the patient wants to be referred as they, them, then refer to them as they, them. That's one that often people have bias against and I hear sometimes, well, it's not grammatically correct. Well, the good news is that the dictionary now changed and I think it's I think it's Oxford, Oxford, I forget which one it is now, um, actually now has that as being um, okay. So yeah, if someone wants to be they, them, use they, them. If they want to be Z, use Z. If they want to be per, use per. Uh, but ask them what they want and then do it. And if you mess up, that's okay. Um, and also it's sort of related to this, it's also okay for people to change and evolve over time. So I think, you know, sometimes people, uh, as they're kind of exploring their gender identity, will, for example, start with they, them, because they really are trying to figure out uh, what is uh, best for them, and then decide, actually, you know, I, I really feel much more masculine. Please use he, him. That's okay. Um, so definitely don't, you know, don't hold them just because they said something at one point. They have the right to evolve. Um, there's another question, what does it mean when they say I am genderqueer, then what is the appropriate question or does it matter? Um, so genderqueer can mean a, a number of different things. It usually means that they don't identify, that they're not binary in their gender, that, they're, that they identify um, as both male and female, but I think it's appropriate to ask, um, you know, what does that mean for you? How do you identify? Can you tell me more? Um, I think it's important um, and I think that will feel very validating. Really important uh, to notice gendered expectations in language. It's really always uh, interesting to me how often we can still make these generalizations. And frankly, this doesn't serve anyone, so it's kind of a good thing to eliminate uh, from our culture in general. Um, but uh, just be aware of all the ways in which we kind of reinforce certain gender type behaviors or traits in girls and boys, um, differences in um, physical contact, which Still is very much a thing. Um, differences in behavioral expectations. Um, so, you know, again, um, this is something that is particularly important for parents, but even in the office, there's lots of different ways that we inadvertently um, kind of characterize people. Um, really important to enhance parental support. I, at the end of this talk, I've put a lot of resources um, around that because I think often parents are far more distressed than kids um, and so the kids are clear it's the parents who are struggling and so making sure that parent that you do a lot of psycho ed um, with parents that you refer parents for support um, if they need it um, and uh, you know really make sure that they're well supported because parents have the right to their own process and this is a, a, a sometimes a pretty big change for them and they are wrestling with all of their own feelings and worries and concerns which is perfectly fine. It just needs to not be the kid's problem. The kid has enough that they're dealing with that parents need a separate place to sort through all of that um, and to work this out without putting it um, on the, you know, on the child. Um, I just got a question about, can we have a copy of the slides? Yes, um, I think the, the slides, if I understood correctly, are going to be up on the McPAP website. Um, so please feel free to access them. Um, and I just put a little bit for parents, if you're guiding parents, these are a few kind of take home messages, um, which is uh, to follow the child's lead and to listen. So as a parent, often, you know, we're, we're kind of directing how things go and, and the ones in charge. And so it can be hard to just sort of sit back and allow the child to take the lead on this and to follow. But around um, gender identity and expression, I think it's really important. Um, and again, making sure that parents are supportive 
and positive. So the picture that I put on the slide is probably one of my favorites. Uh, you may have heard this heartwarming story. This was a, a little boy who um, uh, was wearing dresses and went to school and was teased. And so the dad uh, walked him into school wearing a dress or skirt himself in support of his child. And that to me is the epitome of, of really supporting and valuing your child, not just talking the talk. Um, so terrific example. Um, and I think, again, asking frequently about the child's experiencing, not being hesitant to, to ask them and to talk about the things that they're experiencing around gender identity, sexual identity, um, and providing unconditional support around their suffering. So you don't always have to fix it, and often you can't as a parent, but it's just really supporting them and giving them a place to verbalize it. Um, while having a sense of humor, some things are funny. I once had a, a family come in and uh, the whole family came in. It was a transgender girl who maybe was about nine um, and her younger sister and they, they were they were laughing because she tried to put on tights for the first time, which if any of you have had the, the pleasure of doing that is really far more challenging than it looks. Um, and you don't put them on the way you put on pants. And so uh, it had been quite a struggle and the, the younger sister shook her head and just said, she's got a lot to learn. And it was just such a cute, funny moment. I think just a really good example of how to kind of um, also be able to laugh together around it. Um, and uh, I think it's also important to uh, continue to set age appropriate um, limits. So often because we're looking for resources, we may um, not protect kids from uh, material, for example, online that isn't appropriate, um, or you know, there's often a lot of questions with sleepovers, that kind of thing. So again, just think about if they were cisgender, would you do this? If not, then probably need to not do it uh, just because they're trans. Um, and also provide accurate information and clarify unrealistic expectations. Um, so a lot of kids may not understand, for example, transgender girls, that they may not be able to get um, pregnant. Um, and so kind of how to support them, but still um, kind of clarify some of that. I think sometimes too, there's a fantasy that if they transition, everything is going to be great. Um, and uh, I think some things will definitely get better, but there's still a lot that kids face. Um, I got a couple more questions. So one is, can I list a few specific questions, words you use to ask questions about gender identity and gender expression at each visit? And what age do you start this at? Um, so with younger kids, because we tend to meet with parents first, uh, we'll ask parents you know, as young as three, honestly. Um, and I think it's really important to ask every kid that'll just make it easier for you and then that you're also not singling kids out. And I'll just ask, I work a lot with um, older kids and teens and young adults and I'll just ask, uh, do you identify as a boy, girl, both, neither? Um, or, you know, for older people, I'll be like, what's your, you know, how do you identify? What's your gender? Um, or for sexual orientation, I'll ask about, um, you know, who, you know, what's your, what's your sexual orientation? Um, who are you attracted to? I don't ask necessarily about gender expression. That's usually more just something that comes up. Um, if people raise it, then I'll ask more. Um, but I do ask about gender identity and sexual orientation. Sexual orientation, I don't ask three-year-olds. I ask, um, you know, preteens um, and above. Um, and then another question. In my limited experience with transgender patients, many parents refuse to call them a different name or different pronoun. Any advice? Yeah, that's really common, and that is a big, big mistake. Um, and, uh, you know, I think really figuring out what is it that is getting in the way um, of their doing that is important. I really do try to emphasize, and I'll show you some slides in a second that will help, I think, a little bit with this. Um, one thing that we know is that parental support is critical for the well-being of transgender kids. And so not supporting them is actually very harmful. So this was a study, this is a well-known study from a couple of years ago from Christina Olson and her group that really showed that transgender youth who are supported in their identities, which includes using the correct name and pronoun, have rates of, of depression that are similar to cisgender kids and slightly elevated rates of depression, but much more similar. So it really suggests that one of the most important things that we can do is really foster parental support. Um, and so I really try to emphasize not calling them by the correct name or pronoun is really harmful. You're putting your child at risk. 
Um, and, you know, I try to support parents in, um, in, in working through their own process and um, give them resources, but I do try to be very clear that this is not a harmless choice for the child. Same thing, here's a little bit more information again. Um, it also seems that family acceptance is really helpful for general self-esteem and health and uh, reducing substance abuse risks, reducing suicidal thoughts. So we know that 41% of trans kids will attempt suicide. So it, it can be lethal. And so to me, doing things that reduce that risk um, are important. And I, I, do, I do actually have a very frank conversation with parents about this. Also important to broaden social supports, particularly for kids who maybe don't have families who are supportive, but even beyond that. So if families are not supportive, we really need to find other places where kids can be affirmed and supported in their identities. And there are a lot of resources um, out there, particularly in this area. Um, in addition, uh, making sure that schools are safe, that they have other places that they can go with other trans kids um, really is important. Um, and then looking for uh, role models. So. Uh, you know, something that we don't always think about is how important it is to be represented, to be, to feel like you are not alone in this. And so um, on this slide, I just put a number of transgender celebs because I think there really are a lot of other role models so people can not, can, can have someone to look up to, to be like, I want to be like that when I grow up. And so I think really helping them identify those champions um, is important. Um, and I just, I wanted to play a video. It's a brief video. Um, it's about a transgender kid. Um, and uh, and this is a I thought it would be most important for the child. I would like to have kids have their own voice. So this is a video of a child um, at a uh, elementary school graduation sharing their experience. Um, and I'm going to see if I can figure out how to play this. Or Sarah, I might try to recruit you. Um, let me see. How did I? Um, it does look I'm having like I'm having some difficulty with it. Okay. Um, so we might be able to just attach it to people um, okay, later yeah. on. You can email it out. Well, I actually would prefer not to email this prefer out. Not. Sure. I would want to email out, but um, but anyway, if not, uh, if maybe I can at least play it and we can have the audio. Let me just sort of finish up. Sure. Um, and then I'll see if I can uh, find it on my on my computer. Um, and then again, just uh, increasing other sources of resilience. Um, so building self-esteem in other ways, feeling sense of autonomy, teaching coping skills. All of those things are critical. Um, and then just being aware that for many trans people, uh, enhancing safety at a broader level is key. So for example, the, the public accommodations bill that was voted on uh, this past fall was really essential. And the outcome was, uh, was really remarkable and, and I think very affirming uh, that you know, it was about two thirds of people voted in support, but it was a tremendous source of anxiety and created a lot of stress for a lot of transgender people. Um, and so just knowing that that is going to have a trickle down effect on their health is critical. Um, and also just knowing, uh, for example, a conversion therapy is still legal in the state, uh, unbelievably. There's a bill for the fourth time going through uh, the House and the Senate um, but just know that those, there are a number of conversion therapy places in Massachusetts and parents um, may, may be sending their, their child there. And there's a lot of data suggests that, that these approaches are incredibly harmful uh, to, to individuals. And so just uh, be savvy about that and make sure that um, you inform parents accurately about the impact of, of conversion therapy or um, it goes by different names, but pretty much the same thing. Um, so here are just a couple of organizations in terms of resources um, and then books. Um, another way that you can really show that um, you are a trans-friendly space is by having some of the books, some of the kids' books, uh, particularly in your waiting rooms. Those are all ways that um, people really will, will feel uh, you know, safe uh, in, your, in your office. Um, some of the other books are not child-friendly. I probably would not um, put balls that take some to get some in your waiting room, but um, fun book to read as an adult. Um, so let me see if I can um, pull up this uh, video and tell me if you can hear it. Oh. You'll hear the audio at least. The name of my essay is Transgender and I would like to dedicate it to my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Micah. Transgender, the dictionary definition is the noting or relation to a person who has a personal identity to not correspond to their birth sex. When I heard this, I thought I was like that. When I was a toddler and a preschooler, I was thinking I would be considered 
family, or color. These things included the color pink, the I would think, the color pink, like a mountain, that when you climb, you feel happy and joyous. Big fluffy dresses that fun when you are, and dolls with plastic hair, and drawn on faces that have eyes that never blink, and mouths that never burn. This is what I love to do, but there was one problem. I was a boy, and my name was Michael. So, by the laws of society, I was a misfit or a victim. I didn't care. At least, I didn't care at home. Home, where I was my home, where I was myself. Home, where it felt like I could fly like a bird. Home, where the thick metal bars of reality couldn't hold me in the cage they did. But, as soon as the clock strikes 7.30, the door shuts, I put on my mail sweater and mail pants, the feeling strange to the but you can't touch them. Because if you do, the price for your confidence would be that you were teased and tormented for. For years, this is how I felt, keeping all my feelings inside. On the second day of fourth grade, during a game called Three Things You Should Know About Me, it said things like, I have a dog, an older sister, and I like to draw. But I said, I love ballet, I love crystals, and I transgender. As soon as the last word rolled off my tongue, a wave of shock flew over me. At 8.30, my mom came home. She said that she got a call from my teacher talking about how I said, okay. I could feel water in my eyes. I thought that my teacher didn't like me for who I am, but it wasn't that. It was that she supported me all the way. It was the day, the day I was waiting for and dreading came, the day I would wear a dress to school. To school. I sit down the stairs with a little extra spring in each step. I came down to my breakfast waiting on the table with steam dancing on top of warm pancakes doing pirouettes and twirls before disappearing into the air. My breakfast was barely touched. As I stepped down, I realized my backpack was matching in bright orange. This made me think, will people notice? Will people care? Will they say something? Will they laugh? Will they point or even tease me for it? When I walked to the front door, no one batted an eyelash. There are these kids who looked funny at me or asked inappropriate questions, but I was too happy to care. Except there was one question I didn't know the answer to. Are you a boy or are you a girl? Was I a girl? Was I a boy? At, at the time, I didn't know. I thought I was just trans. Now I know that I was a girl then and I am a girl now. When I came out as a girl, I thought the best part about being a girl was the dresses, the jewelry, and the long hair. But now, it's, but, but really, it was the fact that now I don't have to pretend to be a boy anymore. Um, so I think it's just a, a very eloquent way of describing her experience and some of the fears and anxieties, and also, again, just highlighting the importance of acceptance. Um, there were a couple of uh, additional questions that are important. So first of all, uh, Ellen Perrin is on the phone and uh, or on the the webinar. And Ellen, yes, thank you so much. Uh, you, uh, Ellen, has a, a group um, for uh, parents of uh, prepubertal kids uh, who are transgender or gender expansive, gender diverse, um, and uh, it's been a remarkable group. And so another important resource. And there are a few other groups through PFLAG, et cetera. So I think that can definitely be a, a very important place for parents to talk um, with each other um, about their experiences and how to support their kids. Um, there was also an important question uh, about how do you handle situations where your pediatric patients are not out to their families and it may be unsafe for them to be out. Um, so, uh, so obviously, um, safety is first. And if it is not safe, then um, they need to not be out. Um, having said that, if there is abuse, um, emotional or physical, then um, it may be a DCF issue. Um, or if the parents are divorced, then that might be an opportunity for, for the, the non-abusive parent or the supportive parent to, to intervene via the court. But we always are evaluating safety. I don't think I would ever say you know, to a kid, you should automatically be out um, without evaluating whether that makes sense. Um, that could also be the case where a family can be supportive, but the community um, or the neighborhood is not safe. Um, and so figuring out how to negotiate that um, is important. Um, and you know, finding alternative places uh, where kids can be out 
um, and, and feel safe and affirmed. Um, do you have a statistic for how many kids in MA that are transgender have killed themselves? 41% that attempt suicide is a lot. It is a lot. It is a horrifying statistic and it's a very real one. Um, I don't know how many kids uh, in mass who are transgender have killed themselves. Um, it happens um, uh, It happens more frequently uh, than you might think, um, and we often get data around it and or it gets highlighted in the news. Um, but yeah, no the 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 risk of death is 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 very real and is is um, is concerning. Uh, do I have a, con a contact number for the support group for the parents? I don't know who Ellen is. Um, Ellen, I, I don't know if there's a number that um, you'd like to offer, um, but I'm happy to, to offer that or to put that on the website if that would be helpful. Um, but um, yeah, in addition, PFLAG has a lot of support groups all over uh, the state. Um, is a great resource. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. I'm happy. I know we're we're running out of time quickly. Things always go by so quickly. But um, uh, if there's any other uh, questions I can answer, happy to do so. Yeah, and if people support. have additional, oh, go ahead. Sorry, there was one more question about who has support groups. So P flag, parents and friends of lesbians and gays. Um, if you go on their website. They offer support groups specifically for parents of transgender kids. They are free um, and they are offered in different locations all over. Um, so, and uh, yeah, PFLAG, exactly. Um, and Ellen uh, said that the parent can email at eparent at tufsmedicalcenter.org, E-P-E-R-R-I-N at tuftsmedicalcenter.org. So a couple of really important resources. And additional yeah. resources can also be found at, if they call the MCPAP uh, phone numbers in their region, um, that we can also provide uh, some additional resources as well. Um, and we can also, if, if we can also take uh, any additional questions at MCPAP uh, at Beacon Health options.com um, but if, the, if did we have one last question that wanted you wanted to answer uh, no I was just saying Ellen was highlighting the P flag groups are mostly for older kids that's true more recently they've had some younger uh, kids uh, well the families of younger kids come in but it's true that those tend to be more for like older kids teens young adults um, but they definitely have some groups um, who, uh, like Athena Edmonds, I think, is running a, a group for younger kids as well. Oh, so. fantastic. Yeah, and like I said before, McPap is always happy to offer support um, uh, in the, wherever the, the patient might live in your community, in their communities. Um, we can find additional support groups or, or uh, other resources that would be helpful um, and all, all the, you need to do is call the number that's in your region uh, for MCPAP. And I'm also happy if you have questions about, you know, resources for trans kids, happy to um, to be of support. And we're, we're launching a, a gender minority health program at Mass General um, to, to provide additional mental health supports as well for kids and teens. So, um, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And again, if you have any additional questions, um, we've given out a few phone, a few emails, um, but feel free to email McPap at beaconhealthoptions.com. Um, and please fill out the survey if you have a moment. It's a really short survey, but it does help us uh, improving these clinical conversations. And the recording will be available um, in the next uh, few days up on our website, along with the, uh, with the PowerPoint as well. So thank you again uh, to our wonderful presenter um, and everyone that has attended. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for your interest. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.